serious subject this morning. Um, what is love? It's very hard to grasp the significance of it. It's not something you can te see, touch, or taste, or smell, or even conceive. But I will try my darndest to try to show you what it is, possibly by showing you what it isn't. You see, um, you know, there are, I think there are four different words for love. One is, um, one is eros, you know what that one is. It's sexual love, sensual love, and then the other one is family love. I'm not sure if I pronounce the, pronounce it correctly, is storge. And then the other is affectionate love or brotherly love, is philia. And then there's the agape. The agape is uh, godly love. You know, trouble is the English only has one word for love, and that's love. And you love, you love horse racing. You love wild, wild women. You love, uh, you love food. You love your work, but it all means, you know, you love your drugs, <laughs> you love to drink, and love your car, but it can't, and you love God. That doesn't mean, doesn't mean anything. It loses its meaning. And of course, the common association with love is lust. We lust after everything, and we think we love it. We, of course, the truest meaning of love is need. I need you, love you. But if you look at the word need and interpret it as love, you're getting closer to what it really is. Um, but if you need drugs and they fulfill you, or if you need your wife and that fulfills you, then where is the need for God? What use does he have? I mean, what value do you have if you ate your candy before your dinner? The scripture says the love, and I suppose it means the, the need, if I may take a little liberty here, the need of the world, the love of the world. After all, that's what love really is if you look carefully, whether it's a true love, a healthy love, a healthy love for your creator, or an unhealthy love for the things of the world which fulfill you in a bizarre and egotistical sense, um, it's still a need. And so, it, just off the top of my head, and uh, fight me if I'm wrong, if you think I'm wrong, but I don't think I'm too far off on this one. I may be way off on other things, but this one, no. Um, is love is need. And the only love that a man can have, or a woman, is that need. But if you have your candy before your dinner, then how can you enjoy your dinner? You're already full. There's no room for true love to come in when you've substituted something else. Well, usually that something else doesn't satisfy. Because I think that love pivots on the inclination of the soul. And until we have experienced false love and all of its delights and pleasures and ecstasies and seen, experienced also its deceit and the suffered the pain of, the, of its manipulative uh, powers, its destructive powers, its transforming, its devilishly transforming powers. Until we've actually experienced it, and we may experience it a long time before we admit the truth of it, but until we've experienced it and admitted to the truth of its devastating effect on our lives and our mind and our spirit, we are loath to, to admit that what we love, that our love is 
slavery. Loving and being loved. Hating and being hated. But let's get back to the loving and being loved. Um, there are those who offer the love, who create the need that you cry for. The seducer, that who, who replaces God in your life and creates, recreates himself or herself, whatever, in his or her image inside you, cries with this, this something that they've put into you that cries to them instead of God, so that when you cry, you cry in the wrong direction, outwardly, to the world. You always cry to that which created you. And what created you rises, as I've swiped from Dorothy Baker's uh, editing of my materials, it rises as though you have crooned sweetly for its presence. I would not steal a line from her for all the tea in China and not give her credit. And I thought that was an excellent line she put into one of my books. Um, without my permission, of course, but it fit. <laughs> now that is... I'm getting closer to showing you something. A great mystery. And that you cry to a God false or real, you cry to your Creator, and your Creator approves of this cry. And He responds with His generosity. He will responds with that which you need, which you know not of. You do not know what you need. What you need is... Um, it's, it's life. It's who you are, it's direction, it's purpose, it's intelligence, it's identity. Everything that, rec that comes up in response to that cry has those qualities in it. Without that, you have nothing. With, that, with, with it, you are everything that you intended to be, for better or for worse, for good or for evil. There's a devil's love, and there's a godly love. And how come that we are transferred to a devilish love, and we cry out and look for love in all the wrong places? If we do, there are some women who have been hurt as in, in childhood, and for some strange reason, which I won't go into now, but I know the reasons, and some, you've heard me talk about it before, if there's a bum within 50 miles, she'll be drawn to him. You can't help herself. If there's a, if there's a, a prostitute within 50 miles, some guys, or a, 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 um, a wayward lady, that man will be drawn to that woman, not the good ones. Men are not always drawn to good ladies as men are not always drawn to, uh, women are not drawn to good men, is because there's something in them that has been conditioned to cry out to the wrong source. And so the wrong in the man cries out to the wrong in the woman, and the wrong man is drawn to the wrong in the woman, and they nurture each other. Hence, family breakdown, horror, murder, violence, drug addiction, blowing brains out, destroying children. That's because we do not know what love is. Now, when we're born in sin, the tendency is the first man, as I must keep speaking about this over and over again, even if it's going to bore you to death, I have to keep reminding you of a simple fact that that What's wrong with the human race is that our inclination of our soul is toward, from the very beginning, since Adam chose to play God and, and, and drew upon the love of a woman, that which is not designed to love him that way, to support that 
ego, selfishness, that rebellion against God to be God. But it drew upon that and is sustained by that and is separated. By that love is he separated from God's saving love. Yes, the love of a woman. The female love, as, as beautiful as it can be, as dangerous as it can be, it depends upon the inclination of a man's soul. Now, it is written that in the very beginning of the scriptures that, uh, that Adam was created out of God and was breathed, in breathed the breath of life and then woman was taken out of man and then it went on to say that so shall man or woman leave their mothers and father and come together and be joined to, as together as one flesh you see and that was before the fall that that was for this cause because woman was taken out of man they shall come together they shall leave their mother and father and be joined together and be husband and wife and be as one flesh I, i'm just adding one word into it because you can't be one flesh it has to be as like similar to bonded Scripture's not clear on that sort of thing, but we have to use a little imagination here. It's only because then there was a special kind of love that's supposed to be between men and women, but when and what a respect, a loving respect that a woman has for a man, see, even as a respect that man has for God. And as long as man is in tune with the infiniteness of his Creator, as long as he's bonded and infilled and and his whatever he is is outflowing and expressing itself in terms of human kindness and caring and protection and goodness and mercy and fairness and justice see and throwing a protective shield around the female and the family you'll live happily ever afterwards it's a quality it's nothing you can read about in books you can't just go, can't go to college and learn it. You can't, you can't create it in any way. It's not, it's not anywhere in the world. It's not in any form of pleasure. You can't find it in drugs. You can't find it in the Himalayan mountains, in Tibet, and in, in the gurus up there, and the, in the monastery. You can't find it. It's, it's a special quality that comes into existence because man needs or draws from that which creates him, cries. He is in constant need. He is in constant state of dependency. Remember this, that you, that you are either a slave of evil or, or a servant or slave. Two forms of slavery, if you like. One is slavery. One is, I don't know, sonship, servantship. I don't know if there's such a word as servantship. It's not servitude. I couldn't find a better word. But you know, you don't, you're not free in the middle. You're not floating around in space doing whatever you want. You have a relative. You're relative to God, or you're relative to good, or you're relative to evil. And you have... God, God, God creates love by creating choice. See, because if everything had choice to be whatever it wanted to be, the whole universe would be chaotic. Atoms could decide to be differently from what they were created. Birds and bees could decide what relationship. They can decide their own lifestyle. Everything would be created. Everything is bonded. There's no love except it's an, they are bound and sustained by their, into their environment in a relationship by immutable law. It's called instinct. They kind of know who they are and what they are and what they're supposed to be and the relationship between their environment, their bonding with their environment, the programming coming up from the bonding, their needs and needs fulfilled, sustain them in their particular form. And they're as happy as clams. Pardon the analogy. But only man, the last to be created in a very special way, Um, is the is the brunt of a very special experiment, a divine experiment, 
Because a man is created like all the birds and the bees and the flowers and trees with instincts only, then what different is he than all the birds and flowers and trees? But how can God create love? I mean, not even God can decide, well, you're going to have love. That's, he can create it. See, but it wouldn't be what he wants it to be. He has to create it. Even God has to create things in certain ways, using certain methods. That's what science is. You look at, you look at the mystery of the universe, the mystery of the, of the planets, the sun, the stars, the universe, the, the microbes, the atoms. There's all kinds of laws and rules and principles that go into fashioning these things. So, so love has to be created in a very special way. And so God puts, breathes into Adam the breath of life. He, he fashions them out of the earth. And I, I don't believe in evolution. I believe in creation. Everything is created in a very special way. Everything is created, the foundation is created, and the next thing is created. And out, and out of that foundation, the next thing is created from that foundation. And so we have the foundation, the earth, the sky, the oxygen, the, the, the uh, plants, the trees. So Renee takes the dust of the earth and, and breathes him and makes him a living soul. And then he does something very interesting. He doesn't no one knows where the males and females came from as far as the, adi the uh, animals are concerned. There's, you know, which comes first, the chicken or the egg. No one knows. It's quite a mystery. But he does something according to the scripture. He does something to, according to the scripture. It was very unusual. He clones. First of all, he breathes into Adam the breath of life. Then he clones a woman out of man. He takes a part of a rib, whatever it was. It says a rib, okay, I can live with it. And I think there's some scientific evidence that uh, men have more, less ribs than women do or something like that. If I'm not a nurse or a doctor, but I've heard tell of that. Should have done a bit of research before I opened my big fat mouth. But he does that. And then he says, for this cause, for leave then her mother and father, or man shall leave his mother and father and become joined to the woman, become one flesh. And then he says, he sets a tree in, the, in, 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 the, in this paradise state and says, look, of all the trees you can freely eat, but that one you will mustn't touch. And by this tree God makes his will known. In other words, it's exit. It's either obey me and love God and cleave to him and be fulfilled by him or rebel against God. You know about your own children rebelling when you tell them not to eat candy, that's what they want to eat. It's a nature of children, all of them, they have, the day they come into the world, don't you ever mistake it. They have that inclination as though they've inherited a slavery to original choice. And God makes his will known by the means of that, of that knowledge of good and evil. To love God or to be separated from God. To love God or to be God. And then he puts, we don't know the story of evil, but some thing, the serpent, the most subtle, that's the very important word, the most subtle, because we're dealing with evil, evil is subtle. You don't see evil walking around except you go to Hitler, Germany, and you see it manifest after it's gone through many, many stages of, of rebellions and denials. As you see happening in America, you may see evil rising like a big mushroom cloud, you know what I mean? You can almost feel it over the big cities, like a big pall of black, I don't know, horror. You can feel it as you approach the big cities. People's, the whole atmosphere, the whole environment is being changed by the way people are as they sink deeper into de decadence. But 
God makes his world known by the means of a tree to be God or to cleave to God. Now, the thing is, if you look carefully at the principle involved, and I've used the analogy before, if you have the moon revolving around the earth, it cannot escape. It, if you, if this moon is to leave the gravitational pull of the earth, it must have a heavenly body to give it a choice. See? To give it some kind of a joy. But if you then bring another heavenly body into cl close proximity, it's possible that the moon could leave the gravitational pull of the earth and, and revolve around some other form, heavenly form. Not so? That's what happens. That's, what ha that's exactly what happens in obedience and disobedience. That, we, that Adam's life revolves, began to revolve through disobedience, through making that choice. It may be, it's psychological, psychic. I hate to use that word psychic, but I don't have another word for it. It's spiritual choice. It's much deeper than the flesh and the mind and the brain and the sinew and the bone. It's, it's deep. It's, it's an inclination of the soul. Does the soul incline towards good? Does the soul incline towards evil? If the soul inclines towards evil, it stays where it is. If you're a happily married man, and one of your buddies came up to you and said, let's go to Mexico and pick up a few chicks, pardon the crudeness of this, but and let's have a, have a good time. It wouldn't faze you because you're happy where you are. Yeah, you go on and I'm happy where I'm thanks to you. You wouldn't go, you wouldn't go. Wouldn't it be attractive? But you're not happy. What would happen? You'd see that as an occasion for fun or excitement. To, to seek something you didn't have where you were. So it, the secret is the inclination of the soul. Adam's soul was not inclined, but he had the choice. God knew that, of course he knew it. And of course the question is, well, is it a choice if God knows it? Of course it is. The choice is, he knows it, but you don't know it, therefore it's a choice. He knows what you're going to do, because he knows everything. He also has a remedy, it's called salvation through Jesus Christ. Through sin, one man, through one man's sin, and the whole human race comes into existence. Through one man it goes out, and grace abounds. And there's a great master plan involved here. A great master plan. Yes, much suffering. Because if he gave, if he created every one of you, if he had created every one of you, Adams and Eves, and, and breathed in, into you the breath of life, you'd all, and if that was the end of the experiment, that you'd be separated from God and die and wither, like, like a, a, a plant being separated from the sunlight and wither and die. It lives for a little while and dies. No reproduction or anything like that. And then that's the end of the, uh, end of the matter. Every one of you sitting here would be dead meat. Because you couldn't see what you're getting into. Just like your children cannot see what they're getting into. That's why they need a loving parent to restrain them. But the love that you have to have must be from God. If you don't have the love of God, you cannot save your children from the horror of the world because you yourself are not saved from the horror of the world. You are extension of that horror. You have your own little pleasures and weaknesses and little sneaky things you do that nobody knows about or think nobody knows about, but it affects you just the same. You still have the wrong relationship with your wife who doesn't have much love for you or respect for you or has the, if she has love for you it's the wrong kind it sustains you in your stupidity and you begin to you look contemptible in the eyes of your kids one, you, one, one word to them they do whatever they want you yell and scream and use force but that only doesn't seem to help them much it only drives them into the arms of it drives them away from your home and, and they, they think hateful thoughts towards you you're trying to do the right thing by them, but you haven't got love. You're using animal force. You're pushing a will upon them. Where did that will come from? From the love of your wife. Because you have a will that goes against the will of God. And, and guess who sustains you in this rebellion or this will? The wife who loves you the way you are. And guess 
What's behind her? That same subtle serpent to whom you are both enslaved. The system of hell on earth. It's invisible, but it manifests it through people. Because from the very begin, and remember what he says about, you know, men and women coming together and, and she shall, because you have done this thing, because you've been separated from my will, and you've done this thing, you know, dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return, and you shall bruise his heel, and he will bruise his head, and so on. I didn't say it exactly correct, but they will fight. And, and, in, and in misery and in suffering, you shall bring forth children. You're right on the money. Right on the money. And is that what you see? Where do you see happy homes? Where do you see real love? It's all phony. Have you ever felt, found satisfactory love in anything? Well, there are people who think they have. You know, they, there are those who are in such denial that they'll fasten themselves just about anything that sort of strokes their ego and pacifies any kind of comfort zone they can possibly find that will sort of give them a good feeling. And they sort of they live for those feelings. They live for those delusions that come from those feelings. They dig deeper into that comfort zone. But what are they doing digging into the comfort zone? They're going into something to get away from something, the truth, the truth that can make them free. You know, see, we don't realize, very few of us realize, and it takes a lot of suffering, a lot of suffering, to realize the truth. And then, then suffering doesn't guarantee that we will realize the truth because the inclination of the soul. When does it incline? When is enough enough? How many stupid things do you have to do to know that's not it? That's not where it's at. And that you're looking for love in all the wrong places. And that the love of the world is the enmity with God. The love of the world is God's enemy. But yet, men, men often still think that the love of a woman, their life is revolving around. And the whole world sings the glory of the f feminine gender. And I'm not knocking women, I understand this. I'm just saying women, um, there's no, a, a, a good and beautiful woman, as Solomon said, her price is far above rubies. But so is a, a good and beautiful man. Where do you find them? We're speaking about the aberration. I'm, I'm, I'm not knocking anybody when I'm describing the process because it's only if you know what it isn't, maybe you can know what it is by just flipping, you know, a little bit of imagination. Oh, yes. It's, it's like what I'm doing wrong, but it's, it's not doing it that way. Yes, I see the love of the world, my craving, my longing, you know, my hurting, my aching, my needs. My craven needs are all selfish. My need for food, my need for drugs, my need for women, my need for men, my need for everything outwardly is only um, a replacement, a displacement of what it, things really are. And the proof of the pudding is in the eating. Imbibe, indulge, enjoy, escape, get into it, and, and, and come out of it with what? you come out of it with something worse than you went into it with. We were more empty and more void. And then there's the morning after the night before. The morning after the night before. You start to realize. But you don't realize that the tr what you don't realize is that what it is that's causing you to realize. It's God. You don't understand the language anymore. You've been in so denial that the pleasure is denial. The pleasure that you love the love that you love, the need you love with, the need you cry with, and that which rises to the occasion of that need, see, is not only fulfilling and makes you work, but not only fulfilling, you get into it. You get into it, you escape pain. It's called denial. You take refuge in it, 
And I, I know that the Psalms are full of references to, you know, the God is my refuge. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want <laughs> anything but the Lord. There's, there's a refuge. The word refuge is used hundreds of times. How do you take refuge in the Lord? Stop taking refuge in, what, in, in, in something that helps you to be Lord. Think you're Lord. Think you're God when you're not. Think you're something that you're not. Stop ego tripping into pleasures. Stop thinking that which supplies and nurtures the pain and takes the pain away. Stop idolizing that. Stop glorifying that so it glorifies you. Stop giving it the power to fulfill you. You're giving it the power by the inclination of your soul. By seeing it as an object of fulfillment. And rewarding it with what? The substance of your soul. You have, something goes to, when you cry out to it, when you cry out to anything but God, when you cry out to, I don't like to use the word devil, but I'm going to use it. When you use, cry out towards devilish things, it's like a vampirish, the only way I can describe it is to take something you, you've seen on the, on the, uh, in your, on your television and your theaters, it's a vampirish relationship. The vampire bites, corrupts the human. He bites it. Doesn't have the protection. And draws blood. Somehow that kiss of death that unholy kiss, that bite, love at first bite, introduces into the victim the nature of the biter. Now, although the victim is half alive, is on the way to dying, as something has come from the bitten and is as blood, life. And that, that life is the, is the strength of the vampire. But at the same time, something from the vampire identity goes into the victim. Sooner or later, if he's bitten enough and drained enough and imprinted enough with the identity of the, the vampire, the victim dies and rises again as a vampire themselves. See? Now that has so much meaning. But before the victim dies, notice, even though they put garlands of, uh, garlands of, what do they call it, um, garlic, and the cross of Christ on the windows, and round their necks, when the, presence, when the vampire comes into the room and takes form, there's terror because there's part of them still alive. And yet, a craven need to bear the neck, to offer the blood, their life. For what reason? Because a new life has sprung up inside that person. Not a life from, but, but that which is created in the image of the corruptor, that cries out, it's an identity problem that will, is willing to sacrifice its life, its, its, its living form, for the sake of the completion of who it is. Because love is spiritual, from good or evil. And once we have an identity, that identity will cry to that which recreated it in its image. So even though, no matter what it is, whether it's it begins with women. With men, it begins with women. Not because it's the woman's fault, because there's something, something innate, something that she herself doesn't understand, something that she herself should be protected from by the love of the man. Don't you see? The love of the man should have protected her 
he should have been able to see that. And if, he had a, if the inclination of his soul was pure, he wouldn't have had to see it. it. The offering wouldn't have taken, just like the guy who comes and says, hey, let's go to Tijuana, have a good time. Wouldn't have been touched. Innocence in its purest form cannot be touched. You wouldn't, innocent people are not compatible with anything that isn't innocent. See? It's only compatible with that which makes it innocent and keeps it innocent if it has a fidelity for that. It is only the concupiscence of Adam's soul, the inclination which he himself could not completely understand what he was getting into when he failed to love the woman with God's love and protect her, then what happened? He failed her he drew up out of her, well, he fell to the temptation. He, his life began to revolve around that other unheavenly body. He, it was separated. There's a force there, a psychic force, a spiritual force that drew him away from that. And he became dependent upon it became dependent upon the support of the female in a very sick way. So that he's always giving his life and giving his power for the delusions of grandeur. For who he thinks he is. And a woman is unconsciously compelled to play that role whether she likes it or not. Arabas have no relationship with a man whatsoever. What man is interested in a woman who doesn't play the game? doesn't make him feel like he's ten feet tall and awaken desires and hungers for her which she then satisfies but in the exchange something is lost to her something comes to her, a power she doesn't want if she's a good woman, she doesn't want it but she feels this power clinging to her she feels like, she senses she's destroying her own husband she sees what's becoming of, of her own husband but does not know how to stop it does not know how to tell him. She doesn't understand it herself. And she hates him for that. And then out of guilt, out of hating, because hate, so hating her husband is, is the sin of... See, love is, the, love is the sin of... Loving a woman in a wrong way is, is really hating God, as far as man is concerned. If you look, See, the love of the world, which begins with that, the world as it was represented, as it centered in the female. Um, the love of the world makes you an enemy of God. So man's hatred of God begins with love. You see, the, exciting, the excitement centered in the, the support of the female for his rebellion. And then the sustaining, just like a drug addict, loves drugs. He doesn't really love it, he needs the drug so he doesn't have to feel guilt. And he cries to the pusher. Guess what the pusher, what it does to the pusher. The pusher is under the spell of the, of the addict. The pusher is under the spell. It's, the pusher is not nearly as guilty. Like women are, are not as nearly as guilty as, as men. As the, as, the, as the men are. It is the pusher, it is the addict that craves and demands the supply. You see? And it's the same thing with men. It's women that crave. They're born craving it. They've had no father to help them understand this mystery. Fathers have never understood their own need for love and being loved. And so they're not there to love their children, to separate the children from the craving of, the, of uh, bonding to the woman. Men and women are born bonded to women. Who are bonded to, guess who? To the other spiritual dimension. And so they come out of the womb bonded. They're born in sin. They're born out of a relationship of a false relationship to begin with. Men are subject to that. Men are subject to that influence. They crave it. They need it. And the more they're fulfilled by it, the more animal they become. 
the more conflict they have. The more conflict they have, the more they escape. More, the more they escape, the more need, the more exciting, the more beautiful, delicious, delectable the female form looks. And they get into that form to get away from the truth. And they give in, get, get into it to get away. And after a while it dominates them. It enslaves them. They become hum humiliated. They become emasculated. They begin... So either they remain wimpy and subject, or they rebel, become violent, look to another woman, another female form, escaping from one to another, like like monkeys descending into hell by their prehensile tails. Okay? Because the principle is still the same. And then, then the, the guilt and the pain increases because of denial. Their condition, their inner condition is worse. They're still drawing from the wrong side of their psyche, their soul, is being fulfilled in a wrong. Nothing satisfies. The pain is greater. The longing Then they go to drugs and drinking. Nothing satisfied. All the lowest, lowliest people from there downward, all the way. And you'll notice it's the, the lowest and the sleaziest and the filthiest and the dirtiest and the scummiest. It seems to be attractive to them. It smells good to them. It tastes good to them. Because the inclination of the whole soul hardens. The Bible calls that the hardening of the heart. It makes all the filth and, the, and the, the scum smell sweet. And the, and the fragrance of heaven smells terrible, obnoxious, until the inclination of the soul changes. Until finally, that conscience which keeps knocking on your door makes you see reality and see what, what decadence you've descended into. And, and stop looking for the world to save you with its saving love because all it's doing is saving you from being saved by love. It's a wrong kind of love. It's the love that comes out of rebellion. Man's love, man's love of the world, or the, starting through the female, man's love for the world is a hatred of God. Now a woman doesn't start out hating God, but when a man misuses her, and draws up the worst in him to ser worst in her to serve the worst in him, and when she sees she's being used, then she hates him, because she sees a paradise lost, because only through her him paradise could be found. He failed to love her. He's her only chance, and he fails her and uses her and blocks the doorway to paradise. And so they both live in a hell on earth, living out their wretched days until the end, in misery and horror and hopelessness and fear and trembling. And so she hates the hut man, and, 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 and that hate separates her from love. See, her love it was, is not a re her, her rebellion against God is not original. Not in my opinion. Man's rebellion against God, hatred of God, is original. Yes, yes, she was approached by that other unheavenly body. Yes, but his responsibility was to say, now Eve, now look, put, the, put that food down. You are the extension of me, and I am the extension of him, and you listen to me. Don't eat of it. Also, you have eaten it, I'll forgive you, but I'm not going to eat it, and I'm going to spank your butt for that. That would have been all right, see? But he, she ate it, and he ate it also. He took occasion for that. Oh, well, might as well now, see? She did it. And well, guess what? He blamed her after he was found out. That's denial. And she hated him for that. And that was her failing. And her hate for man, 
who's created in God's image because hate always separates you from love. It always does. Any kind of hate separates you from love. So there came the first hate. Adam loved and therefore hated. See, he loved the forbid the forbidden fruit looked attractive to him. It shouldn't because there was a latent dissatisfaction in the inclination of his soul. And therefore he longed, his soul imbibed that which was shouldn't have done. And that love of the, the fruit, of the forbidden fruit, the attraction of it, and the, and the, and the partaking of it, that love, that, support, that love of, the, of, of that, represented hate of God. But, Adam, but Eve doesn't hate God. Eve hates Adam for not being there for her. Ladies, don't you know what I'm talking about? Don't you? How many ladies understand what I'm talking about? You all have this anger, this rage, because men are not there for you. See? That's all. But then, what does that do? That's a sin too. Believe it or not, hating man, if you hate your own father, don't you see what it does to you? It's like throwing out the baby with the bathwater. If a young man hates a judge, he ends up stomping on flags and burning the flags and, and becoming a rebel or a criminal. You throw the baby, you, 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 you reject everything that created that, put that judge in power. And so therefore you hate your father, you hate everything that brought that man into existence. So you hate your father, you hate God. When, when a woman hated her husband, she rejected God. And she began to draw close to the devil. See, when you reject one... Yeah, it, immediately some people start to... Immediately some people start to uh, respond with anger. You know, defensive to me. You don't need to do that. I can take care of that. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, now I don't see any strange people here. <laughs> well, that lady does need a little, needs to meditate. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I do. Uh, look, in a manner of speaking, people do accuse me of. No, there's no. Just what it. Well, let me explain. Let me explain that later on because it's it's destroying a a, a trend of thought that I have. I'm on a roll here. I think you'll agree that there's a certain role here, and uh, it's, it, if you break, I like to carry on with the trend of thought because, because uh, whether I am a hypocrite or not, whether what I'm saying is still true, and because um, I don't believe I'm a hypocrite, but hypocrites don't believe they're hypocrites either. You know that. But the thing is that you are enamored by what I'm saying because I'm saying things to you that in such a way that you haven't really considered them before. And to make things really clear in your mind, so it is the hearing of it and the understanding of it, which you never had before, which cha can help change the tilt of the soul, the inclination. That's what I, I can't make you. It's not possible for me to tilt your soul in the right direction. That is a great mystery. And I have no understanding of that, of the mechanism of it, nor do I care. It's not my, it's not my business. My business is for every person that wants to come to God and truth, that they understand um, those stumbling blocks. See? And so if you can understand the stumbling block as a stumbling block, if you can see a lie as the truth, you see, or truth as a lie, 
and I didn't say that very well, but if you can see that something lies to you, and, and if you can see, like, the lie that's called love, you always thought that the love of your wife, the love of your husband, the dutifulness that you have to your government, to your country, to whatever, to your drugs, to your culture, is sort of like a, a, a feeling love. It's a sensual love, a feeling love for and from something. You see what I mean? For and from. And then there's a certain allegiance that comes through that, and an identity that comes from that. And then a strange, strange, as time goes by, dissatisfaction. But then you think, oh, I'm not loving enough. So you love more. You get into that person. You get into that church group. You get into your job and you, you throw yourself in it and get something out of it. And then, but it, things are worse. But rather than admit that you're not loving, that you don't know what it is, because we think that we know, especially women, God rest them, God bless them, that they really think they, they have the original love as they come out of the package. See? And men, of course, help them to believe that. And women have such an arrogance. I mean, it, men watch them all the time and they can't take their eyes off of them and they walk down the street and they pretty themselves up and they wiggle and they put perfume on. And to draw attention. And men like to look at women. And they like to have their, their, their attention drawn away to that beautiful form. And, and there's a certain relief by having your attention focused away. There's a relief from conflict. It feels good when your attention can be, can be so captivated and drawn in that a feeling comes out of that. It's a sexual, sensual feeling for the object. And the stronger need is created and, and the little creature winks her eye and, and encourage is and nurtures the need she has created. And men think of that as love. And, and women think of that as, as love. And the, the men sort of losing their life to find it, so to speak, in a, in, a, in a reverse, in a bizarre scriptural twist. Losing their life like the vampire, losing their life to find the wrong kind of life, you see. Um, is a strange awakening and a longing to be fulfilled that with, the, with that which is from the presence of that which is awakened. And it, 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 it's almost like we're awakened in, a, in a, some kind of dream state, although we don't realize it's in a dream state. And it's like we fall asleep to reality and, and we awaken in some kind of dream and, 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 and we experience feelings and pleasures and excitements and um, special effects in that dream. I can't find the word for it. I lose my trend of thought trying to even describe it. I think you know what I'm talking about. It's like we fall asleep to reality and we waken to unreality. We waken in the sensuous. The scripture says it very clearly. The scripture says, says that Adam's eyes was opened. The inner eye was closed. The inner entrance, the access, the sensible and the nurturing from the sensible. And the sensual is awakened. And always, always, traumas and seductions and appeals to that ego, um, the presence of objects which have successfully induced a seduction for it, um, and cr therefore created a need for it, the very presence of that awakens a longing. Awakens a longing. It's like men are opportunists. We're all opportunists looking for something. In any form we can, the familiar and then the unfamiliar become familiar as on our journey downward. As the worse we get, the more bizarre, the, d the deeper we have to dig, the lower we sink, and to bury ourselves to lose ourselves, to find ourselves, to find, to find a feeling rushing up to reward our need for it. A feeling rushes up to reward our need for it. And that creates us. 
that shapes us, that, that forms us, that gives us a certain pattern of behavior, usually criminal, bizarre, perverted. And then the conflict. And to get away from the conflict, we start to look, to focus our attention on something. And something will wiggle. Something will encourage us. Not every woman will do that. A certain kind of woman will do that for a man. Another kind of woman's form will not do it. So he, that one doesn't, he passes the good one that doesn't, doesn't, through which the nutrient of love, the false love, cannot pass because there's good in that woman. He looks for the one who has, who is not saved, who lusts for lust, who's dependent on dependence. You see? It's like the drug addict is dependent and the drug pusher is dependent on that dependence. It's a sick thing. You see? And so there's certain kind of women who are, who are lost, who are, who are willful and wicked. There's not much difference between them. The only difference is the inclination of the soul. If only that woman could find the right kind of man that would stop drawing that worst out of her, her torment would end. Of course, it's not necessary to find a, woman, a man, because there may not be any. There may not be enough. You know, you may be 60 years old, where are you going to find one? You're, that past time has passed for that to be worked out. I don't mean to be facetious. You're a 60 year old man. What are you going to do looking for a woman right now? You really should be looking. It's, that time has passed. You've suffered. You've hurt. It's, there's been enough pain. It's not where you, it's not where you think it is. It, it, it's somewhere else. And you stop looking there. And I have to tell you something, to find love, you, I'll tell you the secret how you know there. Unless you're a, a very stoic person who is insensitive to pe pleasure or pain through some kind of bizarre egotistical discipline. Or unless you have been so hurt by life you're cut off from all pleasure and, and pain because, you know, pleasure is pain. And so therefore you become numb. You sort of psychologically, your defenses, because it's killing you, those experiences are killing you, and some people become so hurt that they become numb and have no feeling at all. We're not talking about that. See, so, I lost my train of thought. Pardon? Yes, that's right. Thank you very much. Um, the way you find love, the way you recognize that you've, you've, the hint that you've found love, except for the fact that you may be stoic and, and numb, discount that. You wake up one morning and you start to look at the world and women don't look so pretty. They're pretty, but they don't, they're not attractive. See the difference? I emphasize the word. See, I think women are pretty, but not attractive. Because they don't attract me. That because I could be said, Roy Masters is a weirdo. See? But they don't attract. They don't draw. If I see my attention drawn to a woman, or drawn to something, boing, I'm, I'm strictly alerted. Something is drawing my attention, because whatever will draw your attention will draw you away from the truth and fulfill you in a sick way. And so I, I've noticed, I've always noticed all my life, anything that draws my attention, I don't care if it's fishing, I would notice that I was fascinated with it or drawn. I stand back and say, that, that something wrong with that. I can be interested in doing it, but to be... To, to be fascinated with this or fascinated with that, not healthy. I don't want my attention drawn away. and I don't want it. I want my attention where it is. See, because what you realize is that the more your attention is held captive by that which fulfills your soul, it slaves your soul. And when your soul is, a, a, when the truth appears the morning after the night before, Reality catches up with you, you see your enslavement. 
you see that love has deceived and you're in pain and you're angry and anger doesn't do a very good job but anger can also help you fixate to that person like the woman you gave me she made me do it anger can also fixate you as well as lust and often anger creates lust see because it separates you from God and creates a greater need for 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 who you are to be fulfilled with who you are with love you see and so when I see when you start to notice that things and it's going to take you a lifetime it can't be done in two minutes but it take a lifetime slowly but surely you're going to start noticing and may, you may wake up one morning and notice it all at once notice it that things are not so attractive to you that your, bar, your job is not so fascinating to you, it's not so important that it doesn't involve you deeply in, in it and you get some deep satisfaction from it, ego satisfaction and that uh, just things in general are not that important that you become, you start to sober you start to sober up and the reason for this is is because the inclination of your soul has taken a little tilt and in that tilt its affection has changed now you can't find, see God who's, whose affection you are coming towards whose love is coming into you but it's saving you and I, I have to give you a talk on what salvation is too all I'm doing is giving you a preliminary talk what I'm saying isn't the whole thing what I'm doing is opening up your psyche, your soul, your mind and just showing you some simple little thing about some minuscule what appears to be very unimportant factor in your life which you may have already experienced but sort of, ah, no, I don't know what, that's not important it is important because it's, it's taken me like 60 years to 63 years to, to see this that you wake up one morning and, and the inclination and the feelings you get from things from what you eat from the sex is not so fun anymore it's okay but you can take it or leave it that attitude because the scripture says Paul says he that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all his ways yeah you can enjoy a steak and you can have good relationship with your wife and things like that but it isn't so good that you want to get into it deeper do you understand what I just said? it's not so good you want to eat more you're not going after the feeling and then after you've gone after the feeling you've escaped from rea you fulfilled yourself because when you travel after a feeling whether it's food, whether it's sex or whether it's music when you travel after a feeling you're really denying the truth and getting, getting an ego value out of it now you may not be a hateful person, leave hate alone just travel after feeling and guess what happens you become hungrier and hungrier and hungrier for that feeling and you eat more and more and you sex more and more and you do some strange things with the food because you've got to get into it deeper and deeper and deeper who knows what I'm talking about I mean, yeah, it's embarrassing but you can do some very strange things with the female body gentlemen I can tell you that referring to getting into things you almost want to imbibe it and it's because that it is, that's the mystery that's what all the sick people get see that, that, that they get something coming up and, and, and their souls travel down that feeling away from reality and when, and when they have come back to their senses again there's a strange anxiety, there's a strange guilt there's a strange pain which only makes them want more of those feelings it makes them love those feelings and love that which give feelings and they're strangely fascinated with it focused on it trying to get as much out of that as, as possible who knows, who understands all that? good so that you know that God is near and that salvation is near, whatever that is when you wake up one morning and you don't love those things as much
I think that covers it basically, doesn't it? Um, because it only takes a little stretch of imagination is because if, you, if you're not into, thi into people, if you're not into places, and you're not, to, not into things, and you don't eat your candy before your dinner, see, then the love of God has room to enter. And he will be into you, and you will be into him. And things will become less and less attractive as his presence is manifest in your life. Everything that you are, everything you can be, your direction, your intelligence, your identity, will be coming from that in a very mysterious, mysterious way. Remember, you're, a, you're a, not a... You're part earth, you're part heaven, see? And uh, the mystery of eternal life is, is that the, the soul seeks out these deep mysteries and this relationship, this invisible relationship which eyes cannot see and ears cannot hear but only that you can only perceive them and you can only understand them and bring them in through that understanding and through that enlightenment and through that understanding it holds a great sway over the body if that understanding is welcome it's like food it's like a breath of fresh air a, call, a wind of the spirit fill, filling you and sailing you off into a, into a direction and completing you and satisfying you even though you can't taste it touch it or smell it it is food indeed with all thy getting you get understanding you can't taste it, you can't touch it, you can't smell it you can just experience it in the joy of hearing about it see and somehow it is such a force, such a power such a fulfillment it makes everything else unfulfilling in its old way fulfilling in a brand new way you start to relate your wife differently you relate to your children differently you extend that to and they see it they are touched by it and they love they love that about you and guess what when they recognize that because they can only love what they can recognize if it's not in you you're not there for them and if you're not there for them, something is. See? Something else that is not good is there for them. And they want to be rescued from that. But if you're there for them, then they see that, that little souls can sense it. Because they have those souls of senses. They sense that you're there for them, even though you may not see it much about yourself. They can see that other side of you, even though you cannot see the other side of yourself. This kind of humility, you don't notice it passing through you. All you know is that you're kind of a happy-go-lucky person and, you know, you don't need a whole lot. You're kind and gentle and generous and brave, but you don't notice that you are any of those things. But you are those things. Other people can see it. Your children and wife especially. You know what they love? They love you for that. They appreciate that. And appreciating that in you, they've appreciated they're loving God. And hating that in you, they're hating God. And you make them fall. Because you're not there for them. They, they remain bonded to the world. There's something in all of you that can save your children. But first of all, you have to understand what salvation is yourself. If I speak with the tongues of men and angels but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong and a clanging cymbal. And if I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and I have all faith so as to remove mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give my possessions to feed the poor and deliver my body to be burned, you know, in a glory, glorious sort of way, but have no love, it profits me nothing. Love is patient, not responsive to pressure temptations. Love is kind, thoughtful, not jealous, doesn't envy anyone for having things, like the socialists uh, try to get you to do, to fall from love. Love does not brag and is not arrogant, puffed up and conceited. Does not act unbecomingly like the lady. Does not seek its own, not selfish is not easily provoked 
Let it know, it says, not provoked. Does not take into account wrongs suffered. Does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with truth. Is happy to hear good things. That joy that you hear, that you have in your heart, it's like food. It rejoices. It's you like you're taking into yourself substance, and yet you can't taste it, touch it, or smell it. It bears all things, it believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. Yes, love never fails. It doesn't matter how, what kind of man you're married to or woman you're married to. Let them run off, don't you? See what I mean? You bear it. Be brave. Be patient. Not be affected. Don't be intimidated. You might save him. Her. See that? That's what love is. Through that kind of love and patience, possess ye your soul. Love never fails, but if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be done away. For we know in part, and we prophesy it in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away. When I was a child, I used to speak as a child, think as a child, reason as a child. When I became a man, I did away with childish things. Do away with your puppy love as you get older. Now, I'm not saying that all of you should run out of this room and stop enjoying things. I haven't said that. Enjoy them until you realize there's something wrong with enjoying them and then look at it. And keep enjoying them. If you don't know how to not enjoy them, just look at it. And just look at the way you're enjoying them. And if you just question, question it. And not just run away from the pain and the embarrassment it can make you feel the awkwardness just you know just see it for what it is scratch your head go on enjoying it until but the questioning will be doing something the questioning the fact that you're willing to question and wonder well maybe there's something better see maybe I'm in maybe I'm enjoying this too much but don't do anything about it because you're a slave of it anyway Realize you're a slave of it. Realize you can do nothing about that. Because you've got to be saved from that. And then slowly but surely there'll be a, a cry formed in you. Save me. Help me. You'll try to help yourself. You'll try to put the skids on. you put the brakes on. But it's like driving with the brakes on. You're not going to make it. You're just kidding yourself. I know you want to do the right thing. But of yourself, you cannot save yourself. You know the moon that is revolving around that, that heavenly body well the moon can't free itself again the earth must loom up its original ground of its existence its original orbit that which it originally orbited around possibly and it must somehow develop an energy and suck it away right see it's gotta, you've got to be sucked away from it it's a, it's a power. Love is a power. It's not a knowledge. It's not a cleverness. It's not a cunning. It is a power. And the scriptures are full about the power of the Holy Spirit. See? And without... And that's what love is. It's a connection to God. And of course, you'll hear me talk about Jesus Christ and his power to save through belief. Trust in him. See, faith, which reverses the order of doubt that Adam had for God. See, and we'll talk about that some other time. But it is a power that you don't even know you have. As a matter of fact, if you want power, you'll never have it. If you don't want power, ego power, that's when you, you lay down your life. If you lay down your ego animal life, you give up all those that empower the ego and make you feel strong and right when you're not. But the, but the inclination of the soul one day will cause you to realize the truth about this power thing, the ego trips, the wrong kind of energy, the wrong kind of power, that sort of thing, the wrong kind of relationship you have with the world. When you start to realize it, you start to repent. You start to be a little sad. You start to hunger and thirst after righteousness. 
and you will be fulfilled. For now I see in a mirror dimly, then face to face, now I know in part, then I shall know fully, just as I also have been fully known. But now abide faith, hope, love, these three. But the greatest of these is love. Then he goes on to chapter 14. Pursue love. That's what it says. That was the next lot of words. Pursue what it is. Long for that. And if you're a spiritual, decent person, you'll find that wherever you think you have love, sooner or later it will be seen for what it is. Not love. Don't fret over it. When you find your love's falling away, don't try to awaken it, like you were missing something. And you start to feel an emptiness and a loneliness and a little pain. Bear it. Because you never want to eat your candy before your dinner again. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>